What are those health benefits? What do we get by activating the CB2 receptor? Right. So like I said, it's, uh, it's mainly re related to the anti-inflammatory uh, benefits. And as you already know, uh, inflammation is an underlying factor in pretty much all degenerative uh, conditions. So everything from neurological degeneration, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, MS, uh, to cardiovascular disease, including um, uh, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Um, we see inflammation associated with uh, uh, things related to metabolism, like uh, the way the pancreas works and insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity, the liver, uh, the way the liver processes toxins and uh, function. So the list really goes on. Um, the crazy thing is, is that when you look at the endocannabinoid system and the, the, the presence of CB2 receptors, it's found in pretty much every single tissue and, and organ in the body. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Lee No, who is a naturopathic physician that I have previously had on the podcast to talk about his best-selling book, Mitochondria and the Future of Medicine, the key to understanding disease, chronic illness, aging, and life itself. Since the time of that podcast, Dr. No has gone on to found a company called Cananda, which is uh, a company that specializes in producing compounds, different plant extracts and terpenes that are designed to help optimize the endocannabinoid system, which is a system built into our biology that is involved in stress and pain buffering, involved in resilience, involved in energy, mood, brain function, sleep and many other aspects of how our physiology works. So we get into that and we get into how these specific compounds work and how they modulate the system uh, to our benefit. So without any further ado, enjoy this conversation, podcast number two with Dr. Lee No. Dr. Lee No, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. It's been a long while since we talked. You were last on my podcast five years ago in yeah. August of 2018. And, um, you know, you're, you're someone that I've had, I, I've always had a lot of respect for your work and it's wonderful to reconnect with you after five years of not talking. Yeah. It's hard to believe, but I'm happy to be back and, uh, chatting with you again. Yeah. And your episode that we did five years ago is one of my most popular episodes of all time. I think it oh, no has, way. I don't know how many tens of thousands of views on, on YouTube and Very that's cool. just the YouTube side of it. There's also tons and tons of audio downloads on iTunes. So, um, where are you now? Well, actually for people who are unfamiliar with your work, um, you wrote a book, uh, on mitochondria that came out in 2017 or 18. Yeah, 2018. Well, that's the, the, the most recent edition of it. Uh, initially, that was self-published back in 2014, uh, then got picked up by a publisher and republished in uh, 2018. Okay. So, and, and this was a hugely influential book on me. This was something that was very educational for me to, to read your book on mitochondria, and, and I learned a lot from it. Um, where are you now at with your sort of your, your relationship with mitochondria, your study of mitochondria and all of that? Well, you know, when I was in the process of having that book republished in 2018, I had already started another company. So um, my passion for mitochondria spans, you know, many years before the publishing of that book and continues to, to this day. But uh, one of the things that I had done in that time was start a company and that has really kind of taken the bulk of my attention. So even though I'm still passionate about the mitochondria and I still uh, dabble in looking at, at the research, um, it's one of those things where running a business that's growing, uh, it keeps me occupied to the point where I really have very little time to pursue other interests, unfortunately. But uh, but yeah, my 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 business is uh, is doing well, and I'm passionate about that. Super interesting stuff as well. So uh, you know, it's something's got to give. And uh, one of the things was uh, you know the mitochondria. But like I said, I still do keep uh, keep up to date here and there. Yeah. Okay. And so the the business that you're alluding to here is Cananda, which Cananda, is a, yeah. a, a, a cannabis focused business. So 
Yeah, not so much cannabis. Uh, we started out as um, as an ancillary cannabis business or looking to target the needs of medical cannabis users, but we've since, since somewhat left that space and see ourselves as almost a standalone business, uh, not dealing so much with cannabis or the medical cannabis users, but dealing with uh, anyone uh, that's essentially uh, experiencing pain, sleep issues and anxiety as the three main health issues we target. But of course, we, we do help a lot of other people dealing with other health conditions as well. Okay, so what's so the distinction between cannabis is cannabis referring specifically to marijuana or is it inclusive of hemp? Forgive me, as a I'm certainly not an expert in the, in that world. Right. Yeah. So so cannabis uh, would include both uh, okay. both the the recreational side, the uh, the medicinal side, as well as hemp. Uh, and of course, hemp uh, has many uses, including uh, a, a nutritious food. Uh, so we. Um, that, that term covers everything, but we, in terms of the ingredients that we use, we use uh, uh, hemp as uh, for some of our ingredients, but we also base our entire line on a class of compounds called terpenes, which we extract due to the way the regulations are in Canada. We extract our terpenes from non-cannabis sources, so that makes our products completely legal in the Canadian marketplace. Um, and, and around the world as well. I know a lot of, uh, when you think of terpenes, they're, they're essentially flavor and fragrance molecules, uh, typically extracted from essential oils. But, uh, and so, you know, it should be legal everywhere, but the source where you get those terpenes from can make your product legal or illegal. And it's crazy because when you think of a, a molecule, the human body doesn't care where it comes from, whether it's an orange or cannabis, but uh, from a regulatory point of view, it does make a big difference. So for us to have our products legal, uh, not just in Canada, but around the world, uh, we extract our, our terpenes from non-cannabis sources. Okay. So let, let's zoom out for people who maybe are not knowledgeable of, of this whole space of terpenes and cannabis and the cannabinoids and let's just big picture. So basically mm -hmm. what you do is you take certain extracts of certain plants that are designed to do what? What's the, the end goal of these extracts? Right, so our, our most recognized and best-selling line of products is called Cananda CB2. Uh, so the CB2, um, if you're familiar with the endocannabinoid system, uh, refers to the CB2 receptor. And so when we think of the endocannabinoid system, which is typically seen as the master regulator of balance in the body or homeostasis, uh, what happens is it's, it's a system that jumps into action anytime a process goes off balance. And the, what it does is it tries to bring that back into balance. So if something's too high, it brings it back down. If it's something, something's too low, it tries to bring it back up. Now, it does so through the activation of these receptors and the two main ones that we talk about are CB1 and CB2 receptors. Now, CB1 receptor is the one that's mainly found in the brain and the central nervous system. And when we activate it, we feel the intoxication. And so when we think of cannabis in the sense of recreational use and THC and people getting high, it's because it activates that CB1 receptor. Uh, on the other hand, we have CB2 receptors and CB2 receptors predominantly uh, uh, exist in the periphery, so outside the central nervous system and has an incredible anti-inflammatory effect. And that's one of the main ways it works. So when we activate CB2 receptors, we bring about a lot of the health benefits associated with cannabis, but none of the psychoactive or sorry, the, the intoxicating effects associated with cannabis. So all the health benefits, but none of the high. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what are those health benefits? What do we get by activating the CB2 receptor? Right, so like I said, it's, uh, it's mainly re related to the anti-inflammatory uh, benefits. And as you already know, uh, inflammation is an underlying factor in pretty much all degenerative uh, conditions. So everything from neurological degeneration, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, MS, uh, to cardiovascular disease, including um, uh, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Um, we see inflammation associated with uh, uh, things related to metabolism, like uh, the way the pancreas works and insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity, 
the liver, uh, the way the liver processes toxins and uh, functions. So the list really goes on. Um, the crazy thing is, is that when you look at the endocannabinoid system and the, the, the presence of CB2 receptors, it's found in pretty much every single tissue and, and organ in the body. And that's one of the reasons why when we look at the health benefits associated with CB2 receptor activation, it spans pretty much every condition that that exists. And, and, and again, that makes sense because it's, it's found everywhere in the body. Um, the research is fairly new and it's developing. A lot of research is going on. And I think one of the things that we're going to see coming forward is so many more health conditions can be uh, helped by the activation of these receptors. Uh, but at this point, uh, there is still enough research to show that, you know what, if you do have, uh, if you're dealing with so any, any sort of health ailment, uh, activating the CB2 receptors is likely a good idea and has been shown to bring things back into balance or at least help kickstart the body in its healing process. I, I, um, I think of human health and physiology through uh, an evolutionary lens, through the lens of evolutionary biology. And one of the things I like to do to kind of um, assess something, assess whether something is logical or not, whether it makes sense to me is ask like, what, what is this? Like, where is the, the precedent, the ancestral precedent for this? Or where is the the need for this based on the mismatch between how modern human, humans live versus how uh, humans lived ancestrally, um, the modern environment versus the ancestral environment. As an example, it's like, well, what's the need for red and near infrared light therapy? Well, most modern humans are getting way less sunlight than we used to. It's, it's you know, it's very straightforward. Um, and, and, you know, there's many other examples of that heat and cold and f feeding windows and intermittent fasting and, and breath holding practices. We, we have these ancestral precedents and these things make sense in that kind of context. What, what is your understanding of like the endocannabinoid system or CB2 receptor activation through that kind of lens? Like, how does it make sense based viewing it from that lens that modern humans need to spend more time activating or doing more things activating the the endocannabinoid system or cb2 in particular yeah you know what that's a that's an awesome question it's something i've never ever been asked before and uh, admittedly something i've not really thought of uh you know previously uh i will say that the endocannabinoid system is an ancient anciently preserved system in all vertebrates and uh, so basically any any animal that has a backbone will have an endocannabinoid system so it you know it dates it, it's been with us for hundreds of millions of years uh, now when it comes to how humans our, our modern lifestyle you know might be somewhat deficient in 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 activating the cb2 receptors and uh tonifying the endocannabinoid system i guess one if and i'm thinking off the top of my head here uh but i guess one of the things and this relates back to the terpenes that we we talk about uh the the main terpene in our cb2 line is beta caryophylline and beta caryophylline is what we call a selective cb2 agonist so it activates the cb2 receptors without activating cb1 receptors again that's one of the reasons why you get all the health benefits associated with cannabis but none of the the intoxication terpenes as uh the main molecules and essential oils are volatile compounds so they evaporate uh quite readily and our modern way of uh, distributing, growing and distributing food where we, we grow things in, you know, another continent uh, prior to its peak ripeness, uh, transported it thousands of miles uh, to uh, sit on a store shelf or, or uh, you know, a, a produce section. All those terpenes are just going to constantly evaporate. So by the time you actually ingest those, those foods, the amount of terpenes that you're ingesting is a fraction of of what you would normally get if you were to eat that um, that fruit fresh or that that food fresh. That's super interesting, and that's the exact kind of thing that I'd be looking for to justify to 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 create a rationale for this. It's like, well, ancestrally, humans you know picked a fruit and ate it, 
And mm -hmm. now you get a fruit, but it, it sits around for days or weeks or, and is transported thousands of miles before you eat the fruit. What happens right. chemi chemically to that fruit before it arrives to you? Okay. It, and, and now there's some connection between that and the endocannabinoid system. Now things start to make right. sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you think of a, you know, a fresh fruit and you pick it off the tree, you can just smell the aroma. It's, it's so potent. It's so fresh. Um, but you, you buy that same fruit off uh, a produce section in, uh, in your grocery store, you know, it, it almost has no smell. Uh, and again, uh, beta caryophyllene being such a potent activator of CB2 receptors and found in many different um, uh, uh, fruits and spices, uh, you, you can see that, you know, you, or you can imagine that our ancestors were consuming a lot more of these compounds than we do today. And of course, without those uh, compounds, we're getting a lot less activation of those CB2 receptors, which, and, you know, um, very similar to what I talk about in, uh, in my book on the mitochondria, where a lot of the underlying processes show mitochondrial dysfunction. Well, a lot of the, the, the same health conditions are also showing uh, a dysfunction of the endocannabinoid system or suboptimal activation of those receptors. So, um, so this is probably one of the, the reasons why uh, that, that could be happening. Very interesting. <clears throat> Can you go deeper in what the endocannabinoid system does, like how, how it's involved in regulating physiology and, and sort of like some of the, some of the mechanisms of how this works, like irrespective of any exogenous compounds, how, how does, how is this working internally and what, what systems, what mechanisms is it modulating to have those effects? Right. So, so the typical symptom, um, so as I mentioned, it, it starts with, um, uh, with something going off balance. And when that happens, certain chemical signals are released. So as an example, in, in the situation of uh, inflammation, certain uh, inflammatory compounds are released and that kind of wakes up the endocannabinoid system to alert it that there's something going on here, we need to address this. The endocannabinoid system is often seen as, um, as a uh, modulatory, uh, uh, it has a modulation function. So uh, what happens often uh, is that things are a little bit too active, uh, whether it's the inflammation is too active or the nervous system is too active and it works through what we call a retrograde signaling. So typically what happens is the presynaptic neuron sends a message down to the postsynaptic neuron, uh, but the endocannabinoid system works in the reverse. So when it when it sees that there's too much nervous uh, signal, nervous system signals going down the, the nervous system chain, uh, it sends the signal retroactively or re uh, through a retrograde signaling. So it goes from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic pre neuron uh, to kind of tone down that signaling and, and tame that, that overactive uh, uh, nervous system, whether it's, uh, you know, um, nerve signals or things like, uh, things related to inflammation. Very interesting. Um, the other thing I should mention yeah. is that we, we do have our own endocannabinoid, uh, endocannabinoid. So these are compounds that our bodies produce that activate these receptors. So as you mentioned, outside of exogenous cannabinoids or compounds that activate these receptors, our bodies would naturally produce these, these compounds. And the, the, and to go back to, to touch upon your previous uh, question about, you know, what might be happening uh, where we have this endocannabinoid system dysfunction or deficiency now uh, versus before, well, there's a lot of different things that, that could be going on and the endocannabinoid system is somewhat complex. So one of the things that we see is uh, so, uh, some of these enzymes that are involved in the endocannabinoid system that break down our endocannabinoids. In, for some reason, uh, what we're seeing is sometimes they're a lot more active than usual. So it, it's too active in breaking down these endocannabinoids. And so these endocannabinoids, which do have a health benefit and can bring about that balancing uh, uh, function, they're broken down too quickly. So they, they, they're not able to have that impact. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have something else called fatty acid binding protein. And these are uh, proteins that bind our endocannabinoids when they're finished doing their job uh, and then usher them out of our system. 
Uh, again, for some reason, what we're seeing is a lot of uh, in, in, in various situations, uh, these we have an excess amount of these uh, fatty acid binding proteins. And so they, again, it, it kind of neutralizes the endocannabinoids so we can't do our, our, our job. And uh, that's probably one of the reasons why certain exogenous compounds can come into play. So uh, I'll touch upon CBD. I will also make it very clear that our products are not CBD. We Our, our products are uh, we call it CB2, but it's predominantly based on beta Uh CBD, however, uh, what's interesting is even though it's a cannabinoid, actually doesn't even activate CB2 or CB1 receptors, uh, but does seem to have an influence on the endocannabinoid system in different or indirect ways. And one of those ways is suggested to be um, to bind the, that fatty acid binding protein. So um, it it uh, kind of takes up the the uh, the the or occupies the fatty acid binding protein so it can't um, bind to our endocannabinoids and take them out of our system. So uh, CBD, it, it does seem to have uh, some utility with respect to the endocannabinoid system, but again, uh, somewhat um, indirect. And one of the reasons why I think exogenous sources of, of those types of compounds can help. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, whereas beta, beta carophylline does act directly on CB2 receptors. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's considered what, uh, we, we can, um, it's known as what we can, um, we call a, a uh, full agonist. So, uh, that means it, when it binds to the CB2 receptors, it's going to elicit the maximum strength of a signal. Uh, THC, I should also mention is a CB2 agonist as well as a CB1 receptor agonist, one of the reasons why THC gets you high, but it does bind to the CB2 receptors, but it's what we call a partial agonist. Uh, so even though C, uh, THC can bind to those CB2 receptors and still bring about the same benefits that, that our product does, uh, this, uh, the strength of the signal is somewhat muted because it's, it's a partial agonist. Mm -hmm. um, is it, it's worth mentioning this for people as soon as you talked about anything related to cannabinoids. Can, can you get high from this? You know, that, that's one thing that people with no sort of experience in this territory generally tend to think with anything related to hemp or cannabinoid, anything is, oh, it's like marijuana, it's going to get me high. So can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, the answer with our product is absolutely not. Um, now, and, and I guess... One of the things that it's important to understand again is that it's the CB1 receptors that give you that feeling of intoxication or that high uh, because our product is an only a CB2 receptor activator. Uh, you won't get that intoxication. That being said, uh, sometimes people ask me, is it psychoactive? And in a sense, our product is psychoactive in the true definition that it alters um, your, your psychology. And the way it does that is, you know, a lot of people will use it for things like anxiety or uh, when they're feeling stressed, it can help calm you. Um, but I would say, you know, even lavender or GABA or things like that, those are all, in my opinion, considered psychoactive because it does have an influence on, on, your, on your brain and mm -hmm. the way you feel, but it's not intoxicating. So it's not, like I said, it's not going to get you intoxicated or high mm -hmm. just to make that distinction. Got it. Um, so this, you know, what, what, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that anything can be overdone. And when you dose something in too great of amounts, you get toxic effects or you get negative side effects. And this is true of literally everything. You can take the healthy, healthiest things in the world that I'm a huge advocate of, like sun exposure or exercise or even even food and water become toxic if you take yeah. if you drink drink two gallons of water in the next 10 minutes you cause permanent brain damage and put yourself in a coma and maybe die right, right. so everything including pure pristine water can be overdone yeah. so uh, of course that's true here too and um oftentimes there's no spacing on what the proper analogy is, whether a free lunch or, or something to that effect. But generally, there are some kinds of side effects when we start experimenting, especially with neurochemistry. I found that, you know, let, let's say you take a pill that 
um, alters your neurochemistry in a way that helps you focus or alters your neurochemistry like caffeine or other stimulants in a way that gives you energy. What's on the other side of that is, yeah. is, is my question. And of course we know with caffeine or Adderall or things of Ritalin, things of this nature, um, there are very serious side effects on the other side of this. Caffeine, for example, alters your, your neurotransmitter systems with chronic daily use. It, it alters your neurotransmitter systems in a way that actually lower your baseline levels of energy um, rather than raise them. So it's like overstimulating this creates, since the body is an intelligent dynamic system, it starts to adapt and go, hey, it, it, it goes, we're, we're being overstimulated. Let's make adaptations that remove some of this excessive stimulation effect. And that actually creates the side effect of lowering your energy with chronic use of this thing that's supposed to, that people are using to raise their energy. Um, right. and, and similar things are true with, with really every substance that tends to alter neurochemistry. So the, the question here, and I think the distinction here is, is this something that is bringing the body back into balance or is this something that is pushing the body out of balance? Like, like the use of stimulants as an example. Right. So, so again, great question. Uh, I'm enjoying our conversation because you're, you're really touching upon a lot of different concepts uh, uh, and things that I don't usually get asked about. So what your question, to answer your question, there's actually a few different ways I can answer it. Uh, so first of all, I'll talk about tolerance. So tolerance is the natural adaptation to a particular, exposure to a particular substance. And what normally happens is over chronic, uh, chronic exposure or high exposure, our bodies adapt and it takes more of that substance to bring about the same effect. So uh, using coffee as an example, you know, when I started drinking coffee in university, half a cup was, was sufficient, you know, um, but as I drank coffee on a regular basis, the, the amount I needed to get that same kind of wakefulness increase. So that is an example of tolerance. And same thing happens with uh, the endocannabinoid system. Uh, what we've seen, especially with me medical uh, cannabis users, as well as chronic uh, uh, recreational users, is that, you know, a small amount when you're starting out uh, is sufficient, but over time, you're using more and more. And for certain medical cannabis uh, users that we've come across, they're in the, using in the range of seven to 10 grams a day, which is a huge amount. Um, but of course that happens over a period of years, but uh, you know, it, it basically our bodies adapt to the point where you, you need more and more to get the same effect. What's interesting is that uh, even though we've seen that with CB1 receptors, numerous studies have shown that we don't seem to see that with CB2 receptors. So tolerance doesn't seem to develop for some reason at the, the level of CB2. So uh, at least in the, the, uh, the number of, a few number of studies that have been done, it doesn't look like uh, you can build up that tolerance with CB, uh, CB2 agonists. So uh, staying with that one particular dose seems to be sufficient. Um, the other thing I should mention is that when it comes to the endocannabinoid system, it seems to operate, and again, I'm, I'm focused more on the CB1 receptor. Again, that's where a lot of the, um, uh, the research uh, that's been done in answering this, this type of question uh, revolves around. And what we see is that the endocannabinoid system works on what they call a biphasic dose response curve. So uh, most things, uh, and I'll use caffeine as an example, uh, work on a li linear dose response curve. So you take a small amount, you get a particular response. You take a large amount, you get the same response, but in a greater intensity. Uh, with the endocannabinoid system, we seem to have a, a, what uh, you can think of it as a as an uh, as a U-shaped curve. So um, you know you have uh, a low dose brings about uh, a certain response, but um, a high dose will actually bring about the opposite response. So uh, I'll give you the example. I'll use cannabis again from a recreational point of view as an example um, where, well, actually, maybe not so much a recreational uh, point of view, but a lot of people do use cannabis as uh, to, to uh, address anxiety. Now, the thing is, is if you're a novice user, 
where your body has not adapted to to that level of THC, or even if you're you're a regular user but you just have way too much for your body, your body's tolerance level, uh, it's going to actually induce anxiety. So so that's a perfect example of that biphasic dose response curve, where a small amount uh, can can bring about one response, but a larger amount brings about the opposite response. And uh, to, to bring you back, bring uh, the discussion back to the mitochondria. So the mitochondria actually have CB1 receptors. And uh, some of the, uh, this is preliminary research, just to let you know, we, uh, there isn't a lot, but uh, the research that I did see uh, shows in some uh, situations, uh, activating CB1 receptors can actually induce the electron transport chain uh, and make it more active. But in other situations, it can actually um, uh, cause a reduction in the activity of the electron transport chain, which is the, the, the key component of oxidative phosphorylation or uh, creating energy uh, through the use of oxygen. So when you look at these, these types of uh, studies where the results are completely conflicting with each other, uh, my, my immediate thought and, uh, is in going back to my understanding of the endocannabinoid system and that biphasic dose response curve is that if you have a small amount of, um, of THC or anything that's going to activate those CB1 receptors, you're going to potentially increase the activity of the electron transport chain, but too much, you're going to have the opposite, opposite effect. So, um, so when it comes to using products like this, I think it is important to make sure that you're using the right dose and the right dose for you might not necessarily be the same right dose for the next person. So it really is an individual thing. Um, the other thing I'll, the last thing I'll mention is, and this is more specific to our products is that every single product that we use or ingredient that we use in our, in our products has a grass status or generally recognized as safe. So these products are, uh, these ingredients are considered food ingredients. So in terms of, the amount that you would need to uh, bring about, say, a toxic uh, um, effect is quite high. Now, of course, um, you don't ever want to do overdo anything, and that's that's true with our products as well. Um, that being said, we've not come across anyone that's re reported um, uh, any sort of toxic effects. So again, as long as you're using it the way that we recommend, there, there shouldn't be any issues with, uh, with adverse effects or toxicity or anything like that. At least we haven't come across that yet. So separate from like toxicity or some kind of acute, serious adverse effect that like somebody takes it and really notices some, some really unpleasant effect, what I'm more thinking of is um, is subtle adaptations that might not even be perceptible, but might be negative. Like, like as an example, um, you know, five years ago in our last podcast, one of the things we spoke about with regards to mitochondria was uh, some of the research, like Michael Risto's research out, out of Germany on antioxidants used around exercise and how antioxidants um, may actually, uh, and many studies do indicate impair the adaptations that you get from exercise. And, right. um, <clears throat> so this is something that somebody who's actually taking those antioxidants and maybe thinking they're doing a good thing, taking antioxidants right after they exercise or before they exercise could do this for years without ever noticing anything negative. Got it. But, but they, they would yeah. have actually impaired a lot of the metabolic benefits that they would have otherwise received from that exercise. And, um, and for people listening unfamiliar with this line of, of logic, ba basically it, this revolves around hormetic stress and that the benefits of exercise and other hormetic stressors are in part, in large part, mediated by the rise in reactive oxygen species, reactive oxygen species or, or free radicals oxidants that are um, produced in large amounts during the hormetic stress. When you take antioxidants close to that, you actually suppress that and therefore you suppress most or a lot of the uh, benefits that you otherwise would have received by allowing your body to adapt to that stressor. By, by right. minimizing the stress on the mitochondria, you also minimize their need for adaptation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> something like that, even with coffee, uh, this is an, in, coffee is kind of an insidious thing because 
precisely because most people will not notice the effects of that. And similarly, you could, you could look at um, anti-inflammatory substances that like there's research similarly with exercise, you take anti-inflammatories close to weight training workouts and you will actually suppress some of the, the adaptation there. So yeah. even with something, you know, we, we all have this kind of shared cultural narrative at this point, like inflammation is really bad. Inflammation drives disease, but inflammation is also necessary and is an mm -hmm. important part of repair uh, and to, to injuries, to damaged tissues. And so if you're, if you're constant, what I'm thinking of here is if you're constantly pushing hard on the anti-inflammatory switch, maybe you're actually suppressing healthy inflammation in some kind of Yeah. So as you're, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, that and I, then I understood your question uh, and yeah, you're hundred percent right. And we talked about this uh, during uh, our, our podcast last um, five years ago. And uh, that is one of the ways that the mitochondria adapts to uh, things like uh, exercise is through that oxidative stress. Um, and, and as you're, you're, you're talking, my, my immediate thought was, uh, going to inflammation because our product is such a great anti-inflammatory. We do know that acute inflammation in, in many circumstances is actually a beneficial thing. Uh, and that's, uh, it, um, that's what can, um, somewhat kickstarts our healing process. Those signals, um, are received by our body. Our bodies send in a, a number of other chemicals to, to start healing the body. And if you're going to tone that down, you're going to blunt the response, that, that beneficial healing response. Uh, so 100% uh, with our product, one of the things that we really want to emphasize is that it's, uh, at, at least with a lot of the research that's been done around CB2 receptor and, uh, and uh, inflammation, it, a lot of it revolves around chronic degenerative conditions. Um, you don't want to be taming inflammation in acute situations. And because our product is such a great anti-inflammatory, if you're taking it during those acute phases, it's probably going to have a blunting effect on the positive effects of those, uh, those uh, inflammatory compounds. So it is one of those things where you, and this, this is true for pretty much everything, whether it's exercise, certain nutrients, different foods. Uh, I think timing of, of, taking anything or administering anything uh, is, is incredibly important. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier was, uh, you know, um, uh, red light therapy or infrared therapy. One of the things that I came across more recently um, is uh, with the, the retina uh, being so dense in, in mitochondria uh, can actually have a tremendous uh, benefit from exposure to red light. But what they found was that the timing of when you use that red light um, uh, can make the difference between whether you're going to get those benefits. And I don't think it showed any negative effects, but you know, if you don't use it during the right time, you're just not going to see any benefit. And I, I don't quote me on this, but I think it was, you know, um, be, uh, in the morning hours, if you expose your, your retina to, to infrared light, that's where the benefits are going to happen. And you only need to do that like once a week to, to get those benefits. So mm -hmm. yeah, hundred percent timing of nutrients or any sort of therapy is is something that doesn't get enough attention yeah yeah i'm glad you brought that up because i was actually going to switch to a timing discussion <clears throat> one of the things that that i've noticed for me personally and i think that this is something that will have minimal amounts of translation for a lot of other people especially people who are largely sedentary and dealing with chronic disease degenerative diseases of various kinds um, but I, I've experimented with this principle of like the, the, the thought occurred to me, maybe I'm overdoing it with some of the compounds that are anti-inflammatories, um, because I'm so physically active. I mean, I, I, I have days where I might surf for, for two to three hours in the morning, go play tennis for two hours, work out or, or do, um, you know, surfing and, and capoeira or jujitsu or like rock climbing or, and, and weight training all in the same day. Some days I have, I have, you know, three to five hours of exercises is, is very often pretty typical for me and, and, and in multiple bouts over the day. And, um, I started to, when I, when I really overdo this too much, sometimes I'll feel chronically 
kind of inflamed and stiff. And some of that's normal. You're just doing some temporary tissue damage and, and inflammation in response to intense physical activity. But I felt like I just kind of had this intuition that maybe I, maybe paradoxically this chronic sort of inflammatory feeling that I have is actually related to too much use of anti-inflammatory agents. And so I backed off some of the stuff that I'm using and sort of experimented with like not using some of the stuff that I would normally use. And I actually feel like it, it allowed for a healthy expression of inflammation to occur after a lot of this intense phys physical activity. And, um, and now I'm interested in like experimenting more with timing. Like maybe if I leave a break of several hours after the exercise and then introduce some of the anti-inflammatory agents, maybe I can, um, have, have mostly a beneficial effect. Anyway, it's, it's everything I'm talking about is mostly speculative. Um, and none of it's even reflected in my blood biomarkers. Like my, my inflammatory biomarkers are rock bottom. They're extremely low. But it's all just kind of a feel thing, an intuition thing, extrapolating mm -hmm. from the same kinds of logic that we were just talking about um, with antioxidants, for example. And uh, I, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned timing because my, my, my hunch now is that timing of these things is really important. Yeah. And, and I think outside of, you know, dose, uh, uh, you know, when, when we talked about even water, you know, too much of water can, uh, can cause some, some serious adverse effects. I think uh, to to a lesser degree, uh, the, the timing of of nutrients will will have a huge influence on whether you have adverse effects or have positive effects. And and yeah, like like I said, I think it's something that doesn't get enough attention. I don't even think that the the bulk of the research community understands the importance of this. I think the few studies that have come out that looked at looked at this, whether it's the red light therapy with the uh, retinal benefits or the antioxidant uh, intake and, and uh, adaptation to exercise, things like that. There's some early hints that this is something that we need to pay attention to. But um, I think a lot of people just think that it's not a relevant aspect or a variable in, in many situations, which I'm going to guess if that research is done, we're going to see that timing is actually a, a, a critical factor, uh, even when it comes to something like uh, sleep, you know, like uh, some of the research I was uh, seeing with sleep, depending on when you go to sleep. And again, this will vary depending on the individual and your, your own circadian rhythm, but depending on when you go to sleep and when you wake up um, has a huge influence, you know, you could sit, still sleep uh, seven hours, eight hours, but when those sleep hours occur will influence how much of a benefit you get from from sleep so right. yeah i think it's 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 a variable that is going to be something that uh should be looked at and will be looked at and we're going to start to understand the importance of that uh sooner or later if, if you had to guess based on your knowledge of this area and personal experimentation what would you say would be the optimal timing for the use of beta carophylline and in, in your products? Um, if I had to say, I would say um, in the evening. Um, and that's when, that's when a lot of the, oh, well, in the evening, so that, uh, that, that those, the anti-inflammatory benefits are taking place or having an effect while you're sleeping in because sleep is so regenerative I think that's when, when uh, you know, that is the ideal time to have those those benefits. And again, I'm speaking uh, without 100% uh, seeing any sort of research to confirm. And this is just again going based on my feeling and my my intuition. Um, but throughout the day, we're uh, whether we're exercising or any any anything like that, uh, we are kind of increasing that that inflammatory those inflammatory markers. Uh, kickstarting the healing process, uh, and at night we can start to, uh, you know, bring back the the uh, tone down that inflammation or any sort of um, uh, 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 signaling, so that our healing processes can start to kind of kick into into gear and start to regenerate. Um, 
and I know that has a huge benefit to, to things like brain health, where uh, depending on different phases of sleep, we're, we're starting to, you know, clear out a lot of the, the, um, the, the junk in our brain, so to speak. And I think that has a huge, uh, a, a big part of that is related to the amount of inflammation that's going on. Mm -hmm. Dr. No, I've, I've really enjoyed this. Um, are there any final words that you want to leave people with and, and maybe um, also, can you let people know what kinds of uh, things you're hearing from, from users of, of this product and what kinds of, of issues and symptoms, uh, people are generally reporting the most positive effects from? Yeah. So I, I as I mentioned, I think the, the three main, uh, health conditions that people are using our products for and the three main conditions that we see the most uh, testimonials for are pain, sleep issues, and anxiety. But when I look at the, the breadth of uh, different conditions, I would say it ranges, it, like it's gotten to the point where nothing surprises me anymore. Uh, and I hear a lot of these incredible stories um, and and again, whether there's research to support it or not, again, it makes sense to me because our entire body is full of CB2 receptors. So um, I, I've heard uh, amazing stories with respect to things like Alzheimer's, uh, people you know, at late stage Alzheimer's in a long-term care facility almost brought back to, to full health uh, after a few months of using our product to, uh, to uh, migraine sufferers who, you know, uh, in one situation, I remember uh, the, the person telling me that they were on Botox injections for migraines that she's had since she was a, a child. And uh, uh, after using our products, she's, she's offered Botox uh, uh, medication or injections. Um, you know, I, I, I'd hate to, you know, talk about the, the big C, but we even had, you know, uh, success stories with that, uh, where it's, I, and I can't say it, it was definitively diagnosed as, as that, but you know, when we, when you have an ongoing open sore that fails to heal, um, for, for a couple of years, uh, that, that is very suspect and, uh, using our product, uh, after a few months, uh, the, the sore actually healed for the first time in a couple of years and the, the lump under there kind of decreased by, by half the size. So we have a lot of different testimonials covering a, a range of different health conditions. But I, like I said, I think the vast bulk of the, the uses are using it for pain, sleep and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Dr. No, uh, let people know where they can follow your work or learn more about your company and your products. Yeah, so our, you can check out our website. It's Cananda.com. That's C-A-N-N-A-N-D-A.com. Uh, and on Instagram as well, which is Cananda Crew. Awesome. Thank you so much, my friend. I look forward to our next conversation, hopefully not five years from now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks again for having me, Ari. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next.